should get your spirit moving, right? Amen. Thank you. Be seated, if you will. Thank you for being here. We welcome each and every one present, those who are attending a VI Zoom, I mean, uh, streaming as well with us live. We thank you for being present and trust life is good for you. If there's a need that you have, please let us know. We'd love to try to help you and meet that need as we can. But we're glad everybody can worship together, whether we're in our living room or whether we're in this building. We're glad we can make that happen. So God is good. God is great. And we recognize His sovereignty, we recognize His majesty, we recognize His goodness, and we celebrate that today as we focus upon uh, the gratitude of our hearts together. So let's pray together. Father, we thank You for giving us opportunity today to recognize Your love, to recognize Your grace, to recognize Your omnipotence, to recognize Your power, to recognize all that You are, and we give You thanksgiving for all those things. We want to say we worship you, we love you, we honor you, we reverence you, we recognize you as Lord and King of our life. And may what, whatever is going on in our minds this morning, may it just dissipate, may that we focus on, on the goodness of who you are and the glory of who you are and, and realize where we, where we are placed in the midst of that glory. And we honor you and we thank you as Father and as friend. In your name that we pray, amen. those men up, if you will, to usher, uh, for ushering today on the offering. Now, we're doing a little different today, and just ask those ushers to wear the masks as they take up the offering. We want to try to bring this back as a part of our worship, because giving is a part of our worship. It is a part of our glad-heartedness and our gratitude to God, because we realize that God has given us the things that we have, and we give back to Him the portion of what He's given so graciously to us. There are two offering plates for uh, the two men for each side. Uh, we'll have four, 
four ushers here. So we get, we're only counting three here. We're missing. Okay, Doug, there you go, buddy. And uh, Doug, if you'll do that. And, uh, and I'll just have a prayer so I know that the people at home can hear because I've got the microphone on me. Father, we thank you for this offering that we're able to take up together and to celebrate because of the great bounty and provision that you've given to all of us. We realize that there are needs in this world and, and some can only give one little mite, but yet some can give a bunch. But yet we know it's not about the little and it's not about the much. It's the fact that we give from the gracious of our heart as we recognize all that you've given to us. Bless this offering unto the use of your kingdom and its causes. In your name that we pray, amen. This morning, I want to talk with you about living in gratitude, living with gratitude, not in gratitude. Sorry about that. It's from Miss Print in the bulletin. But living with gratitude. And it's a difference in living in it and then that which we live with. And so not to, not to uh, use a cliche, but to remind all of us of the necessity as well as the joyful acclamation of gratitude. To realize that you have what you have not because of what you've done. That you have what you have, I have what I have because someone has allowed us to have and enjoy what we are enjoying recognizing that God is the giver of all those good and perfect gifts and that you and I are the stewards of those gifts in which we live them out and flesh them out throughout our life and throughout our lifestyle, demonstrating that we are the stewards that which honor Him in all that we are given 
and all that we have. It's very easy to get caught up into the consume, being consumed or the consumerism of all those things of our life. It's easy to get caught up. We all have those tendencies and temptations. We, have, we deal with that in life. We deal with that with our children. We deal with that with our parents. We deal with that in our own individual life. It's just one of those temptations we have to ward off and say to ourselves that we don't need to go after being consumed with the items that really do not matter. But living with gratitude as Christians, living in the United States, we have so much to be grateful for, more things than we can even fathom. I'm reminded of a wealthy Texan who was in the habit of giving his uh, father unique gifts for Father's Day. And one year, he gave his father hang gliding lessons, and his father loved it. The next year, he gave him a whole collection of Slim Witten's hits autographed by the singer. So in the most recent year, he outdone himself. He purchased this rare kind of South African bird called the translator. This bird could speak five languages and could sing the Yellow Rose of Texas in any key standing on one foot. The talented bird cost him $10,000, but he felt it was worth every penny because it was his gift to his father. So that Father's Day passed, and so he called his dad the day after Father's Day and said, Dad, how did you like the bird? The father responded, it was delicious. (laughs) We have so much to be thankful for even that which we cannot see and those things we really cannot value at time. Francis Schaeffer once said that the beginning of man's rebellion against God and is the lack of a thankful heart. Nowhere is this sentiment so elegantly expressed than when W. Henley's famous poem entitled Invictus, which in Latin means unconquered, It's a testimony of the unconquerable human spirit. It's the imagery that a person is standing at the gates of hell, unafraid because they've become so sufficient unto themselves. You're likely heard the final stanza of that poem. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. How well this summarizes sentiments between our our day and time in which we live all across this world. And yet we're tempted to fight the prosperity, to fight the, the strength and the happiness that we can obtain and we feel we can obtain on our own. We fight against that trend. We fight against that current And yet solely we realize that the attitude, the scriptural attitude is consistent when it's a spirit-filled life because it wells up within us the recognition of who God is and who we are in relation to God. Those of us who know Jesus, those of us who have been born again, yet washed in his blood, given the gift of eternal light, should never give in to this sentiment. We have so much for which we are grateful. We have the gospel. We have the good news. We have the privilege of sharing it with the rest of the world. And yet, Psalm 100 is a beautiful psalm to look at as we read that together. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth and serve the Lord with gladness and come before Him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His His people, his sheep of his pasture, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His love is eternal. His faithfulness endures through all generations. Let's look at this passage. Five practical understanding or truths that apply from this passage. And the text itself gives us the points for this sermon. Number one. As you look at verse 1, shout triumphantly to the Lord all the earth that he is worthy 
of our praise, that he is worthy of our praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, the King James Version reads it. Kaufman Kaur states in the Jewish Encyclopedia that no language has more expression of joy and rejoicing than that of the Hebrew language. And in the Old Testament, 13 Hebrew root words derive 27 different words that are used throughout the Scripture and throughout the Psalms that primarily are pointing towards the joy that is mentioned in Scripture. Shout joyfully unto the Lord, all ye people. About two years ago, uh, my sons and I went down to Miami and we watched a football game. And Dave and Mary, if you're listening remotely, I'm sorry to mention this illustration, but we were sitting there in the stands and there were 16 seconds to go in the game. The New England Patriots just, just scored to take the lead. We're all dejected and we become tuna fish instead of dolphins sitting there in the stands to, you know, sucking up the defeat that we had to face. And my son said, hey, Dad, it's not over till the fat lady sings. I'm not trying to make any kind of slur there. That's just a phrase he used. And I said, yes, yeah, son, right. 16 seconds to go. They kicked off to us. We ran the ball, got it to about 25-yard line. And so there's six seconds to go in the game. One play, one impossible play to score a touchdown. And so we're all on our feet, just really thinking, okay, let's just get through the crowd, get to our car, get back to the airport and fly home. And boom, yow. They caught the ball. And then they lateraled the ball. Then they passed the ball. Then he continued to run the ball. And he ran it all the way, down, all the way back for the touchdown. All the Patriot fans had already left. And all us tuna fish were still in the stands. And we began to shout till we lost our voices, raising our hands, carrying on like dummies in a football stadium. And we won the game. The miracle in Miami is as, as it said. I even purchased the picture of the guy who came through the end zone right there in front of us when I snapped the picture was the very picture that I was able to get, of course, professionally done of the same picture I caught on my cell phone of Gronk trying to tackle the runner. We were going fool. You know, why can't we do that for God? Why can't we give him the applause? Why can't we shake the foundation of heaven with our shouts and our joy and our exuberation and our enthusiasm, our thankfulness and our gratefulness for everything God has given us? And we forget about our needs. We forget about our desires. We forget about all those little in, in, intricate details of our life that bog us down. Why be so reserved? We have access to heaven. We have access to the throne of God. We have access to the, the very one who created our bodies. We have access to the one who keeps the waters flowing in the ocean and the mountains raising in the skies. We have access to Abba Father. And we should applaud all of heaven. And yet he's worthy of our praise. The word noise, to shout joyfully, get, make a joyful noise, and it means to break forth with, to burst out with noise. You know, it sends the imagery of someone who is so full of emotion that they're unable to contain that emotion and, and they, they don't make an idiot of themselves. They just make a spectacle of themselves that's good. And people take notice. When was the last time that you just shouted your joy to God? When was the last time that you gave Him a standing ovation? When was the last time you raised your hands in victory and you gave him your all of you? And being enthused with God means being possessed by God. And our enthusiasm is a possession that God takes residence up in us 
and it's for a purpose to give him praise. Our Sunday school lesson this morning was all about that. And it's trying to, to rec- help us to recognize why we worship God and why we praise him. Number two, coming from verse two of that psalm, it says, serve the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. And second of all is he's worthy of our service. Serve the Lord with gladness. It's interesting that I never saw this in Scripture. And I've, I've read that psalm. I can quote that psalm. I've, it's one of the favorite psalms you go to if you were asked on the spur of the moment, uh, is there a psalm that you could read or a Scripture you could read that speaks to this occasion of Thanksgiving? You go back to Psalm 100. It's one of those psalms that just grab you because it, it speaks of Thanksgiving. And I never saw this until looking at it for this time, for this day. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before Him. The word Him is translated His face. Come, serve the Lord with gladness and come before His face with joyful songs. It gives you the picture of Moses going in the tent and having a face-to-face conversation with God and wrestling with God or wrestling, whichever part of the country you're from, and you, you wrestle with God over the issues that you're having within your heart and you have conversation with God and you're talking to God as a friend to a friend and you come before His face and you serve Him with gladness and you give Him the joyful songs. You recognize Him as Lord. You recognize Him as God. You recognize Him as King and you recognize that you are who you are because of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's worthy of our service and we serve Him with gladness based on the psalm of Psalm 100. Serve the Lord implies three things. It implies having a heart of humility and serving God with a humble heart. It implies commitment, being committed to uh, being faithful to God throughout our lifetime and throughout our, our life as a believer. And yet we recognize the activity it involves and it involves serving Him with our whole heart. And we're doing what we're to be doing for Him. Many people think that service to God is confined to vocational ministry, but that's just one small aspect of that service. I can't do what I do if it wasn't for the church. It's the people. Or I'd be preaching to an empty pew and to the green family, because that's what our chairs are, green. And I can promise you they won't do anything without the bodies that's sitting in them. And so it's, it's the makeup of the church, of everybody put together. It's what makes the service a joyful service. And yet Scripture tells us that all who know Him as Lord and Savior are ministers and priests and representatives and ambassadors, as the Scripture calls us to serve Him and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Remember, God is more concerned with what we are than what we do because what we are are will determine what we do. Did you catch that statement? God's more concerned with what we are than what we do because what we are will determine what we do. And so when God's giving the law to the Israelites that's recorded in Deuteronomy and you see all the Levitical laws that are recorded even in Leviticus itself, He told them that they would be cursed if they did not serve the Lord with gladness. And with gladness of heart is the abundance of our heart in love towards God. It's something about having the thankfulness within us. It causes us to see less of what our problems are. It doesn't make them disappear, but we focus less on those things and we focus more on the heavenly things. You know, When something tragic happens or something that occurs in our life that takes us back, that says to us, oh my goodness, I'm dealing with this and I didn't know I was going to deal with this today. It's almost as if you're looking at a screen, a radar, and the whole radar is covered because of your problem becomes the whole radar, the whole screen. But then as you work through it, it becomes smaller and smaller 
And as you look back, it's just the dot on the screen. It's always been a dot on the screen. It's just how we look at it. And so gratitude helps us to remain seeing the dot and not all of the screen <laughs> and being succumbed to and, 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 and being overtaken by the abundance of what has hit us. So many people who claim to know Christ and know Him as a Savior live their lives devoid of the joy and gladness. Some may serve him out of greed. Some may serve him out of wrong intentions. Whatever it is, a person who does that cannot see the Lord in his entirety because we're seeing something else other than him. A man who is greedy is destined to a life of unhappiness. Why? Because it's temporal. The physical things, the earthly position, the human accomplishment cannot meet the spiritual needs of any person's life. I've been there. I've tried it. And it's a failure. A, a person whose treasure is on the earthly things has deep spiritual needs beyond those earthly things. Again, I've been there. I know that. But we will never have our needs met until we focus upon the supreme God of this world, the Jehovah God, the Lord God, who is, who is always God and remains God, whether I give Him my joyful service or not. He is who He is. Honesty sometimes is hard to say to yourself, God, I'm, I'm selfish. <laughs> it's, you know, honesty to say to God, God, I, I had my attention diverted it's, it's hard to be honest with God and say, I blew it. <laughs> you know, I put you second or third. It's, it's, honesty is hard because honesty will reveal the intentions of our heart, whether it's selfish or unselfish. We're blind to the blessings of God and how undeserving they are. I like how John Maxwell puts it. The instant we're born... <laughs> We're already, we already owe someone nine months of room and board. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And we never can pay it back. We spend a lifetime thanking our parents for what they've done. We can never do enough to say thanks to God. And just because we can't do enough doesn't mean we don't try. And so we give him that thanks, and, and yet we don't want to lose the joy of our salvation. We want to live in the joy of our salvation. And thank a thankful heart, realizing that he's worthy of our praise, he's worthy of our service, helps us to capture the joy of that salvation. Just like our marriage, our marriages, our relationship to the Lord does not have to become a grind, lacking passion and zeal. It only gets the way it is because we allow it to happen. If something's wrong in my personal life, in my fellowship with God, it's not God's fault. He didn't move. He didn't run. He didn't take a break. He didn't, he didn't leave me out. He's always there. Number three, a practical application based on this verse goes to verse three. Acknowledge that Yahweh is God. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. And so third of all, He alone is God. No one else deserves our service like He does. He is God. He's first in our lives. Scripture teaches that. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first what? The, the kingdom of God. All this righteousness that is wrapped up in the kingdom of God. In other words, all this righteousness is wrapped up in the Lord God is yours and mine if we seek it. If we seek the God who, who gives us the graciousness of that righteousness. He alone is God. Acknowledge that He is God. No one else deserves it more than Him. He made us and we're His. He made us and He owns us. When we, are, we, we sold ourselves out to sin, but He bought back the price that it took to bring us back through the precious Son of Christ. We have no claim. We have no right to our lives. They belong to God, contrary to our thinking. <laughs> Hate to bust our bubbles. We are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture. We are the representatives on earth. And as His sheep, He leads us, provides us, provides for us, guides us, confronts us, 
comforts us, protects us, heals us, prospers us. He alone is the source of all the blessings that flow. The ancient Chinese proverb says, when you drink from the stream, remember the spring. When you drink from the stream, remember the spring. If you drink from the stream of his goodness, remember the spring of his blessing. And so you and I understand that he alone is God. Number four is that he's worthy of our thanksgiving based on verse four of Psalm 100. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. He's worthy of our thanksgiving. The Israelites could only experience the presence of God through the Ark of the Covenant. That's why they made that ark and they put three things in that ark that was symbolism of great things that remind them of the hand of God at work in their life. And they traveled around with this ark, this box. No one could touch it except the priests who were designed and they would carry the ark. And as long as the ark of covenant was with the people of Israel, they realized that God was with them. God resides now through Christ inside you and inside me. He lives inside all of us who place our trust in Him because of the forgiveness of sin and because of the eternal salvation that we have been given. So for the New Testament Christian, we're always in the presence of God. We cannot escape as His presence and our attitude should be one of thanksgiving because He alone is worthy of that thanksgiving. He alone is worthy of that praise. We're thankful and we bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name. For all that He has given me, the good that He has given me, the provision that He's given me, the bounty that flows, for all that is ours, we give Him thanksgiving for that. Bless His holy name. He's worthy of that thanksgiving. And when you think about where we are sometimes, it's very easy. I know it is. It's very easy to get caught up in, in us, to us ourselves. It's easy to get caught up in the problems and the situations and all those sorts of things. But we bless Him. We praise Him. The blessing that is... When you understand blessing in Scripture, keep this in mind. Blessing is transferred from the greater to the lesser. Who's the greater? God. Who's the lesser? We are. So the blessings that flow are coming from the greater to the lesser. And yet throughout the Old Testament, you find people seeking God's blessing. You recall the story of Isaac's son, Jacob, who wrestled with the angel, and he would not let the angel go until the angel blessed him. He was recognizing that he was in need of the greater transferred to the lesser. And it was given from that greater God whom we worship and we know as the Lord God, Jehovah God, Elohim, the God of all this universe. Ancient Hebrew understood one thing about blessing for abundance and effective living, and it was that it only came from God. No wonder the Israelites went into the wilderness for 40 years. They had no, they had no pantry. They had no refrigeration. <laughs> they had no supermarket to drop off to. They didn't even have porta johns. <laughs> and they went into the wilderness. And in that wilderness, they recognized that food fell from heaven and water spewed from the rock. And that when their needs were there, God met them. And yet they were thankful for every provision and bounty and blessing that was bestowed upon them for when they acknowledged that He alone is God. And when God was ready, He granted it. And they enjoyed every moment of the day. A person could never be separated from the name of God, according to Hebrew. That's why we are to bless the name of the Lord because we cannot be separated from His name. As much as I would try, even though I'm not going to, but as much as I try, I cannot banish my name of who I am. I can change my name legally 
and I can give myself a whole new last name, but it is not going to change the fact of who I am. And when you and I are born again believers, we are attached to the name of God and there's nothing we can do. There's nothing that could ever remove you from the name of God. Nothing the height, depth, width, or length can take you away from the name of God. There's nothing that you could ever do to be plucked out of His hand or be removed from the name of God. You belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you are attached to His name, so why not bless His name? Gratitude. It's living with that gratitude, not living in it. When the scripture tells us to bless the Lord, he's telling us that we must profess, acknowledge, accredit, recognize, confess, all those things to God because God alone is the source of all that happiness and he's the source of all those blessings that flow from the greater to the lesser. And when we do this, we have no choice but to give thanks. That's why it's impossible to be in right relationship with God and be void of the attitude of having gratitude towards God. This is the natural result of a proper understanding of who God is and what He has done for us and who we are and what we can't do for ourselves. And if you want to know why He's worthy of our praise, then look at verse 5, and 5 and last is this, God is good. For the Lord is good, the scripture says, and his love is eternal. His faithfulness endures through all generations. And yet this is why we give praise to God. We're told that we are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. He's good. He's merciful. And he is truth without end. I love the analogy of being given an invitation. Benji, you have been invited to the king's court and you're the only one that the, door, the gates are going to open to. And when you approach that gate, you don't have to knock. You don't have to swipe your card. <laughs> you don't have to wait for the, the electric beam to let you in. It automatically opens through true invitation that allows me to walk through the gates with a heart of thanksgiving, to come to the center court. And as I approach the center court, the king of the world joins me. Face to face, hand to hand, foot to foot. And asks me, why are you here? And I bow in reverence with a heart of thanksgiving and I say, I am here because of who you are, and I have what I have because you are good. You are good beyond goodness and any definition that I could describe. You alone are worthy of praise, of service. You alone are God. You are worthy of my thanksgiving, and I recognize that God is good. And nothing else matters but God. What a wonderful picture about the things that are truth in Scripture. And one of those is thanksgiving. Let me close with three simple suggestions that I think can help you and I gain and maintain the gratitude in life and live with this gratitude. First of all, take note. Take note. This means to live with the awareness to take note, become aware of that which is around you and all that you have. Open your eyes to the world around you and you will be shocked because it will cause you to be grateful. God is the giver of all those good and perfect gifts. Take note. Number two, take inventory. Take inventory of the blessings. Go around your house. And say, God, did I gain this blessing on my own? <laughs> Go around your, your, your work world. God, did you, did I, do I have this because of what I have done? The car you drive, the house you live in, the people you, you, you're with, the people you sit and have dinner with, all the things that you have, 
Ask yourself the question, is it because of me I have these things? Count your blessings upon life's billows, your tempest tossed. When you're discouraged and thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Beautiful hymn of Count Your Blessings. Have you stopped to count the blessings in your life lately? Number three, take action. Turn the attitude of gratitude into an action of appreciation. Do something good for someone else in the name of that which you are a part of, of the name of the Lord God. God has given you plenty. Share it. God didn't give it to you to solely hold on to it for your benefit. He placed it in your hands to see what kind of servant you are with what you've been given. He gave you all that you have so that you could be the person you are. He is, you are his ambassador and he is the king. And you're invited to come into the court and you're asked to give account to all that that he has given you. And what will you say? Jesus says when we act in kindness, blessing others, and even from a cup of cold water... It is done in His name, the least of these you have done it unto me. And now in this life, you see the good that it will do. A rich man once asked his friend, Why am I criticized for being rich? Everyone knows that when I leave this world, I'm leaving everything to charity. His friend shared these words. Well, let me tell you about the pig who lamented to the cow one day of how unpopular he was. People are always talking about your gentleness and your eyes, says the pig to the cow. Sure, you give milk and cream, but I give more. I give bacon and ham. They even pickle my feet and enjoy it. Still, nobody likes me. Why is this? The cow thought for a moment. Maybe it's because I give while I'm still living. Think about it. Give while you can. Show your appreciation to God on how you serve Him with what He has given you. On April 30th of 1863, one of the greatest presidents of the United States stood and gave his proclamation for a national day of fasting and prayer. And this is what he said. We have been the recipients of much bounty that flows from heaven. We have been preserved in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers as a nation. We have grown in numbers in wealth. And we have gained power unlike any other nation that is ever known. He went on to state in that proclamation but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which has preserved us in peace, has multiplied the bounty, has enriched us and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become so self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to God that He made us. It behooves us, the president says, to humble ourselves by the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for forgiveness and pardon. Isn't that powerful? Does it speak to today? Absolutely. How about you? Does your life presently demonstrate a sense of gratitude to God? When others see you, are they aware that you live your life for someone else to whom you owe a great debt? <laughs> Is there joy in your life? And does it show? Have you demonstrated your gratitude to Christ lately? Those are questions not to bring judgment or to create guilt, but to cause you to take inventory, to take note and act upon them. 
simple suggestions that may behoove us all to join in together and do together. Thanks be unto God for that which He has given us and for the provision that we enjoy, for the bounty that is beyond belief, and for the Spirit that is at large working within us. Father, we thank You for all that we have and all that You are and all that we can become. Thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your mercy. And thank You, more importantly, the pardon that You have granted to each of us who believe in Your name. The identification and the rights that we are to be called children of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God. We reverence you as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. We praise you beyond our understanding, even that which we cannot even conceive. We give you praise for all that you are and all that you do. We recognize your work in life, not only in the world in which we live, the place or community in which we live, but the world at large that you work. In the inward crevices of the darkest parts of the world, out in the African jungles, you exist. In the industrialized society in New York City, you exist in the homes in which we go home to, in the comfort of the life we live, you exist. We give you thanks and praise for all those things and that you are more than we could ever describe, that we could ever understand. And until we're face to face with you in heaven, grant to us a grateful heart and a joyful disposition with an excitement and enthusiasm to look you face to face and say, Abba, Father, thank you for being God and for being good. In your name we pray, amen. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. Jesus Christ, His Son, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. Lord has done for